table, not the kids' table. <laughs> It's Friday, November 24th, 2017. Welcome to Raging Chicken's Out to Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week, I'm usually talking to our capital muckraker-in-chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state national politics. But it is Thanksgiving vacation, and Sean is MIA. Reports have begun to emerge on Twitter, however, that someone with a Hi, my name is Brett t-shirt was seen stumbling out of Forest and Main Brewery Company in Ambler singing Fly, Eagles, Fly at the top of his lungs. And that happened apparently after getting it into an altercation with someone vaping at the bar. These are, however, unconfirmed reports at this point. Well, but since we weren't able to give you a show for uh, this, you know, oh, God, I guess it is Black Friday, isn't it? Uh, yes, for this Black Friday. We didn't want to leave you without a show this week, so we decided to give you something um, we hope is going to be a little bit of a treat for this Thanksgiving. Uh, today, you're going to hear our first ever Raging Chicken interview from back in November 2011. Now, this was, uh, we were just like four months old at that point. We had launched in uh, July 2011. And um, we were, uh, I have to say, we were pretty floored, but uh, we were able to score an interview um, with Noam Chomsky um, in that November 2011. It was the day after he spoke at uh, Kutztown University for World Philosophy Day. Um, he agreed to give us a, we had like a 45 minute interview. It was pretty amazing. Uh, we talked about the Occupy movement and then um, it's, you know, I guess Occupy was about in its second month occupations around the country at that point. We talked about social movements in the wake of the Tea Party victories in those midterm elections and the assault on working people that began in Wisconsin and the Wisconsin uprising. And we talked about the roles of universities and social movements. Um, it was a pretty good interview. Now, I'll warn you ahead of time, the audio was not great. Uh, frankly, we didn't really know um, what we were doing. We had some experience and stuff before, but um, the the place where we interviewed him was very echoey. Uh, we didn't have him mic'd up in the way that we should have had. Um, so I've tried to kind of clean up the audio a little bit for you. Um, I wanted to bring it back. And, um, yeah, you know, I have to say, it's given the fact that we're seeing this huge uptick in organizing and everything going on now, um, yes, in part because of Trump, but also as we saw in, you know, kind of this year's elections that, um, you know, we've actually seen some solid left organizing where you've seen actually socialists that are kind of winning across the country. Um, and that's that's good news. And so this was kind of like also, uh, I thought at least, kind of a cool point to reflect back a little bit about um, where we've come since 2011. Um, and it's gotten dark, very dark at times, um, especially in the wake of the Trump victory and the um, reemergence of overt white supremacy, um, white supremacist, you know, fascist organizations. Um, but it, it's also, you know, it's, there's also some progress there. Um, uh, maybe we're learning the lessons on the left. We'll see. I don't know. So we've got this interview for Noam Chomsky. Um, and we hope you like it. And the way it's kind of run, I'm just, um, I'm just going to play it through. And there's like three segments and the levels a short break. Um, you can also check out those interviews um, on YouTube, actually. Um, those on our YouTube channel. But uh, this will be the, the podcast version of them. And so um, I'm just going to leave you after a couple more announcements. And um, um, I kind of could run through, the, run through the, uh, the interview and see what you think. I'd love to hear what you think, um, what you thought of the interview. I'd love you to think about what Chomsky had to say. And, again, I apologize for some of the audio quality on that because it is, uh, it, it is a little rough at times. I try, like I said, I tried to clean it up. So anyways, but if you like what you hear um, at this podcast, you like what you read at Raging Chicken Press, um, you want to support Pull No Punches Progressive Media, yeah, we need you to become a member of Raging Chicken for as little five as little as five dollars a month. You simply go to the ra- RagingChickenPress.org and click on the support and membership tab. Um, click on become a member and you're on your way. Not ready to become a member? No problem. You can just make a one-time donation at the same place by just clicking donate. You can also look us up on Patreon. We're right there. Slash RC Press. Pretty cool. Now, we've got uh, a couple exciting, I think, end-of-the-year membership specials running right now. Um, you may have recalled a couple weeks back, we had Chris Robay on um, as an out-to-coop extra. 
and uh, we're talking about his book, Breaking the Spell, A History of Anarchist Filmmakers, Videotape Gorillas, and Digital Ninjas. Um, and that's pretty much our pick to close out 2017. We're adding it to our bookshelf, and you can too. Um, now through the end of the year, we will send you your very own copy of Breaking the Spell if you become a member of Raging Chicken Press at the $10 a month level. But wait, there's more, they say. Now, we announced the Chris Robay special uh, last week. Um, but we we want to give you some options, and we really need to build our membership base so that we can get more writers on board to cover the 2018 elections, I mean, especially here in Pennsylvania. Um, Pennsylvania looks like it's going to be a hotbed of um, Koch Brothers money and other right-wing money um, at the for, for the gubernatorial race and for the Senate race and done a local race. Um, you've got, you know, everything is lining up here. Steve Bannon has been in the, uh, has been in the state. You've got the people that were running the Trump campaign in Pennsylvania. Um, they're supporting out there. They've, they're active in the campaigns already. And we want to make sure that we are on the ground and we are exposing these people for what they are. Um, so you have the option. You can, for $10 a month, you can get Breaking the Spell or, and this is a big announcement, or you can get an original Raging Chicken Stay Woke t-shirt. Right now, if you saw our new logo, it's a circle logo um, that says um, "Pull No Punches" on it. Raging Chicken Press, and on the back it just says big letters "Stay Woke." It's a black T-shirt, and it's got our it's got our new logo on the front, and it's got "Stay Woke" on the back. Um, you may have seen us wearing them around before. Um, that's pretty cool. We will probably have some of those available too for sale um, at the uh, Keystone Progress Summit um, in February, but we'll more on that later. So if you want to come in at $10 a month level, you can choose either uh, Chris Robay's book, Breaking the Spell, or you can choose to get your very own original Raging Chicken Press Stay Woke t-shirt. That's the big announcement. And, and if you join at the $15 a month level before the end of the year, we will send you both of those. So, hey, you know, oh, did I mention? We'll also send you a bunch of cool swag, too. So become a member of Raging Chicken Press today. All right, so that's it, folks. And uh, I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. I hope everything, everybody's safe. Uh, you're taking some time with some friends or family or just a little break for some uh, from the grind uh, that we all do, that we all go through. So um, here's to it. And I, I wish you a, a happy what remains of your uh, Thanksgiving vacation if you were able to have one. Um, I hope that you're staying away from the big box stores um, for this, this crazy crazy time of year um, black friday and we're also going to be uh hoping that you know we can enlist you to help spread the word and get other people to join as raging chicken press members soon so with that i'm going to leave you uh with our interview with noam chomsky from let's see november 2011 i was looking for the exact date but i couldn't find it november 2011 and um just so you know just here where we're gonna it's gonna get launched right into this um so we kind of we have uh you're not gonna hear my question noam chomsky is gonna start right in talking a little bit about um the occupy movement we're gonna move in from there all right this is kevin mahoney editor and founder of raging chicken press uh we will be back to our regular schedule next week but for now here it is folks couldn't believe that we were able to score this. Raging Chicken Press interviews Noam Chomsky. We'll talk to you soon. Well, the, um, there has been the Occupy movement, as I said in that talk, in fact, is quite unprecedented. I can't think of anything analogous to it. Uh, but these are quite unprecedented times. Uh, we are now in the uh, beyond the 30th year of a very sharp change in American history. You take a look at American history since the beginning. I mean, there were various ups and downs, and it wasn't very pretty in a lot of ways, but there was a rather steady tendency towards growth, development, industrialization, mm -hmm. a sense of hope for the future. Uh, and that was true even in really dark times. I mean, I'm, old enough to remember the Depression, and uh, my family were mostly working class, mostly unemployed. And objectively, it was a lot worse than it is now, but subjectively, it was different. There was a sense of hope. CIO was organizing, there were sit-down strikes, uh, the uh, WPA was doing uh, uh, occupations, uh, there, were, there was worker education, uh, I mean, my unemployed 
relatives, some of whom never got past fourth grade, were uh, in, uh, uh, going to Shakespeare plays. You know, they had a high culture. The union, my uh, uh, aunts, seamstresses, unemployed seamstresses, were in Hillwood, you know that. Mm -hmm. And so they, it, was a, it was a world, it was a life. You know? yeah. And uh, a community, uh, a week in the country, uh, you know, something to do. There was a sense that we're in it together, we're going to get out of it. That's just not true now. Um, for the last 30 years, there's, when it started in the 70s, there was a sharp change in the economy, conscious change, uh, towards uh, deindustrialization of the country. I mean, in, uh, industrial production con continues, so uh, the Apple computer still continues, but at Foxconn. Right. Uh, so when you buy an Apple computer, you're buying something where the parts, the components, the uh, a lot of development comes from Japan, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and it's assembled in China uh, with very little value added, incidentally, under horrendous working conditions. And then you buy it here, and the profits go back to Apple. And it's the same across the industrial system. So by now, we're, you know, in manufacturing, a real unemployment is about the level of depression, but uh, with a big difference. In the late 30s, you had a sense that it's going to come back, that we're going to get it back, you know, we can do it. And now the, the sense of um, the working people with some justification is that unless policy changes sharply, we're not going to get it back. It's over. And there's a general sense of malaise in the country. Uh, sort of, they see it the same is true in attitude towards institutions, like Congress, you know, might as well disappear, everybody hates them. <laughs> and the same is true of just about every other institution. Now there's, a, 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 and it's objective. I mean, for the roughly 30 years, uh, uh, real incomes have barely grown for most, of, pretty much stagnated for most of the population. For a tiny sector, I mean, so small it's not even picked up in the census, but there has just been spectacular wealth. It's actually about a tenth of one percent. That's, uh, and that reflects the other major change in the economy, along with the deindustrialization, conscious deindustrialization of the country, came uh, financialization. So investors could make more money playing ridiculous games with uh, uh, speculation and so on. You know, can you keep this other guy out by a second in the trading? You know. Uh, and the financial sector grew in enormously. By, by 2007, before the latest crash, there was about 40 percent of corporate profits. And it doesn't do anything for the economy, in fact, probably harms it. Uh, but it does create enormous, highly concentrated wealth. Also draws plenty of talent away from other things. Mm -hmm. So take, say, my own university, MIT, Science University. has a great math department. But a large part of the math department is now devoted to financial mathematics, which is just a waste to undermine the economy with uh, various kinds of trickery. And that's not only harming society, but it's also drawing away talent that could be used for you know, developing uh, advanced uh, uh, engineering and uh, uh, production for the things that people need. And the society is not going to survive if it doesn't produce things people need. You know, it can go on on the basis of uh, uh, inertia for a long time, but it's a self-inflicted decline. And for the population, you've got this tremendous gap between uh, stagnation, malaise, uh, lack of hope for the future, and uh, fantastic wealth. I mean, I remember a couple of weeks ago there was front page story, front page of the New York Times had two stories. Uh, one of them was about uh, the growth and the poverty rate, you know, the, uh, the disillusionment, the lack of hope that people can't buy what they need, they have to go to food bank. Right next to it was a story about how in luxury stores they're raising prices, because it doesn't matter how much you raise the prices, people are going to buy it anyway. So, uh, and, and that's the country. Well, out of this the, the Occupy movement is actually the first organized, large-scale protest directed to the whole set of problems. And Wisconsin was very important, but that was specific. It was due to the uh, efforts of the government to try to destroy the last remnants of uh, working-class organization, and that was 
very impressive mobilization against that. But the Occupy movement is, a, a, it's kind of across the board. Let's go after the whole range of issues that is destroying the society. And in that respect, it's uh, very hopeful and uh, kind of inspiring that people who are involved are putting themselves on the line. Um, not a lot of fun to sleep in the park uh, mm -hmm. day after day. And they've also developed uh, uh, communities. Um, there's a, a sense of solidarity that's been reemerged. Mm -hmm. And that was always the core of the labor movement. Solidarity wasn't just a slogan. It meant you're working together. You know, we're part of broader society. And that's being rebuilt within these movements, and it's uh, it, it, it's quite significant, I think. They're setting up kind of bonds, associations, learning how to do things together, community kitchens, uh, health centers, libraries, and well, uh, that's the positive side. Mm -hmm. uh, the it's of course, uh, power never says goodbye, yeah, thanks, take it away from <laughs> me. Uh, it's it's going to fight back. And, uh, it's, and uh, we happen to have, you look at U.S. history, it's, a, it's different than European countries for a lot of reasons, uh, but it has a highly class-conscious business community, uh, always fighting a bitter class war, very conscious about it. You read the business literature, it reads like uh, the, the Red Mouse Red Book with the values of her. You know, you got to fight the uh, everlasting battle to win the minds of men and uh, overcome the uh, uh, organization of the masses, which is a threat to you know, power. I mean, it's a, and, they, and, and uh, 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 in fact, the 70s, the shift in the 70s came from organized efforts to respond to the dangerous uh, democratizing tendencies of the 1960s. That was pretty explicit. I uh, could talk about it, but anyway, it's explicit plan. And now that uh, this movement is developing, the backlash is, of course, developing along with it. And there's going to be barriers. You don't win things quickly. It takes a long time. I mean, say, civil rights movement, you know, it didn't begin when Martin Luther King made a speech. You know. In fact, it started in the 30s. And a lot of long struggle, fairly, you know, 1960, it, kids sitting in a lunch counter, Freedom Riders, or, and then, uh, finally a big movement developed. But it's interesting to you learn a lot about the United States by seeing what happened to it. But as long as Martin Luther King was talking about racist Alabama sheriffs, he was popular among, you know, relatively popular among the elites. As soon as he began shifting to class issues, yes. he was kill, killed off. When you listen to the speeches on Martin Luther King Day about how great he was, it typically ends with, I had a dream, not with, I'm organizing a poor people's movement, or I'm going to Memphis for a sanitation strike where he's assassinated. And, uh, and that reflects the, you know, the deep-seated ideolo elite ideology that the only thing that matters is the rich and the powerful, and the rest are sort of in the way. You know, uh, of course, it's not the way the population thinks about it, but it's uh, it's the way power sees itself. And it means the media and so on and so forth. So there, yes, there's, there's, it's going to be a long, hard struggle. You can't just sit in a park forever. <coughs> right. You have to reach out to the community. You have to organize other groups. Uh, uh, there was a poll that was just reported today saying that about half the population doesn't understand what mm -hmm. the Occupy movement's about. Well, we'll try to overcome that. Well, I'm glad to hear what you were saying too about the, the bonds of association and solidarity. Um, is that this is one of the things that I think it's also most difficult um, to, commu to communicate to people about how this is absolutely critical for any time long term sustainability. And, um, you know, I look at the labor movement, which I've been active with. Uh, my, my family's been labor folks from the beginning. Um, but um, one of the things that seems to me is that's one of the few places where you have the historical memory of what those bonds of association mean in very practical material terms. That's one of the reasons why there's such an effort to destroy the labor movement. I mean, the U.S. has a very violent labor history as compared with comparable countries. And the labor movement several times has been smashed. 
I, I, one of the great books, I'm sure you know, of, of American labor history, David Montgomery's uh, Rise and Fall of the Labor Movement. The fall that he's talking about is the 1920s. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare practically wiped out the labor movement. Uh, and in the 1920s, you know, the right wing columnists, the journal journalists from England and Australia, were coming here and they couldn't believe how working people were treated. And, you know, they couldn't get away with that. And, conservative circles in other countries. Well, it did reconstitute in the 30s, and in the 40s even more so. And it, but the backlash started right away. I mean, as soon as the war was over, in 1947, half heartedly, uh, it started with huge campaigns to try to uh, undermine support for labor and undermine this notion of solidarity. I mean, it's not just labor. Uh, you take a look at the what's called the Republican Party. It's not a political party in any traditional sense anymore. For the last 20 years, it's been so deep in corporate pockets, you need a telescope to find it. Uh, they try to cover it up, you know, so we've got to have uh, no taxes on the rich because of their job creators. You know? they got so much money coming out of their pockets that so they don't know what to do with it. Not. But you keep saying job creators, job killing, and the media just repeat it as if you know, it's well, kind of like North Korea. Yeah. But, but, it, but, but the point of, but, but if you look at what they're opposed to, it's very striking. It's not just labor. Of course, they're opposed to labor. Uh, they're opposed to Social Security. Why are they opposed to Social Security? And why do they pretend that Social Security is a deficit problem when they know it isn't? Front page story at USA Today, they know it isn't. Uh, why are they trying to destroy public schools? You take a look at the things they're trying to destroy, and it's the ones that are based on solidarity. Mm -hmm. Social Security, the fundamental idea is I'm supposed to care if the disabled widow across town doesn't have food now. And that's what they're trying to do. And same with public schools, like I don't have kids in school, but the public school system means that I'm happy to pay my taxes so the kid across the street can go to school. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of these things that are the targets of uh, what's called conservative, I mean, over reactionary propaganda, and across the board in the media and everywhere else, is really aimed at the conception that you ought to care about other people. I mean, that's kind of the opposite of the, you know, kind of Randian notion we just threw out for ourselves and hope everyone else. Uh, and uh, that battle goes way back, like back to the early days of. It's very interesting to read the, it was very lively labor press in the mid 19th century, mm -hmm. the early days of industrialization. And one of the themes that comes through, it really resonates today, is a denunciation of what they call the new spirit of the age. This is 1850, the new spirit of the age. Gain wealth, forgetting all but self. That's mm -hmm. what they regard as just undermining their basic humanity. Uh, working people, you know, factory girls uh, from the farms, mm -hmm. artisans from the boss, and, so and that battle's still going on. Gain wealth, forgetting all but self, so the hell with Social Security, get rid of public schools, and destroy unions, uh, everybody in it for, your, for themselves, but I'm going to win because I have all the power, so you guys are just going to suffer mm -hmm. be the slave labor force or unemployed force. Yeah, and I said, you know, one of the things that you said, like, um, to, uh, this question that was asked you last night, is a question that you hear over and over and over again about, um, well, what can we do? That question. And it always astounds me, right? The story I always tell is like, you know, I grew up with punk rock, right? Punk rock was a DIY culture, right? You, you saw a problem, right? You whined about it for a while, and then you did something about it. Um, and it's been remarkable to me um, that that question is out there and the agency that's just given over in the question itself, right? By saying, well, what can I do? Um, and one of the things that you said in response to that was, look, there's no shortage of opportunities, right? And I think you said there's there's a shortage of dedication, yeah. right? Um, there's a sense that it should work tomorrow, and this is part of the, part of the. I mean, it's understandable when young people, you know, yeah, I want to talk, sure. I want to do something else. But uh, uh, what may, I mean, whatever you think about the old Communist Party, you know. Uh, the people, there was one really good thing about it. Uh, 
but they knew that they were in it for the long haul term. Now, you're not going to win tomorrow. You're going to have a defeat, but we've got to be around for the next time. Uh, the next time. And you get a kind of continuity of, and, uh, you know, there were learning experiences. You learned how to have a demonstration, uh, how to organize a strike. You'd have to learn it new every time. Uh, there's always somebody around to turn the mimeograph machine in those days. You know, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, that kind of dedication and willingness to be in it for a long-term struggle, thats it's been a little bit swept away by the more or less instant gratification culture. Uh, you can see it in the, it was true in the 60s too. So for example, in the uh, 1968, when students uh, uh, had a strike at Columbia, there was a big strike. Uh, and sat in the president's office. I remember you know, kids I knew I was talking to them. And they really thought that if they sat in the president's office for a couple of weeks, there would be a world of peace and love and pot and friendship yeah. and so on. You know, it doesn't happen that way. You're going to get rousted out by the cops. It will be pretty be brutal. And you've got to be ready for the next step. Uh, and that didn't happen. Uh, so when they were, uh, were kicked out, it sort of disappeared. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of thing is what you have to get over. It was the same with, say, the Iraq War. It was, it was the first time in, in the history of imperialism, first time, that there was a massive protest before the war was officially launched. But then the war came, of course, and the protest declined yeah. just when it should have been picking up. That's the kind of thing that has to be overcome. It's not going to be an easy struggle. Nothing ever is. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, one of the things that I find um, remarkable, I always go back to um, what Miles Horton when he talks about the, the long haul. And I thought that that tradition, uh, what I remember, I didn't even read about him until I was well into grad school. Um, and what was remarkable to me about the fact that that tradition is so far gone from any kind of mainstream education, which is such an integral part of um, like the specificity of American culture, um, and the whole idea that you're educating for the long haul, that things like teaching folks how to engage in strike action, how to organize, how to talk to people about organizing, that that was productive work. Um, but you didn't expect to see the results of it, maybe even in your lifetime. No, that's true. Um, and the civil rights is good. The you know, civil rights movement took off in the 30s. And it, you know, Martin Luther King, great figure, but it was the 63. Um, this kind of goes specifically to um, um, the kind of the place of the university in all of this. Um, and uh, I've recently uh, we've been rereading uh, Chris Hedges' book, The Death of a Liberal Class. And, um, and you know, he's, he is, I'm sure you know, you know this, uh, he's a really scathing critique of kind of liberal institutions and talking about the, the, the kind of complete sell out to kind of corporate interest and the hollowing out of any possibility of this um, dedication to the teaching of critical thinking, critical analysis um, that might serve the kind of long-term movements. Um, and uh, then he also talks about how, you know, they stood by uh, and it actually held silence some of the more kind of radical critics within this. Um, given that, um, and you see students that are now fairly active in this Occupy movement. Um, you see uh, attempts to kind of move back into kind of the university. Um, how do you see the university in all of this? Uh, is there even the possibility that this institution can still contribute um, um, in the ways that kind of Chris Hedges is critiquing, like uh, contribute to actually building the kind of critical analysis and long-term um, sense of struggle? Um, or are we too far gone at this point? I, I mean, this is a real to Kerr, you know, this part, and well, I think it's a great book, he's a terrific guy, I like him very much, but I think this is overstated. In fact, you know, there's a kind of a sense of a past golden age in there, and there never was a past golden age. In fact, if you go back uh, 50 years, I think the universities are a lot worse than they are now. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, effect of the 1960s 
on the university was, was significant. Uh, people, uh, not only, you know, uh, people came out of that atmosphere who were committed to critical analysis, activism, and change. And the country's changed enormously, and the universities with it. So it just, take my own university as an illustration, but it's across the country. So I'm at MIT, so premier of science engineering at the university of the world. But when I got there in the 1950s, uh, it was white, male, uh, conservative, well-dressed. You wore a jacket and a tie all the time, even if you visited your friends on Sunday. Uh, that meant deferential uh, obedience. You do your work, you don't ask any questions. But that was the atmosphere. There was nothing going on. Uh, take a look, walk down the halls today. It's half women, third minorities, casual dress, kind of like we're dressed, uh, which means informal relations. That means uh, questioning. Uh, issues such as central issues at a place like MIT, like what's the role of technology in society? Nobody asked those questions in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you, 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 your job is to do your work. And, you, know, you remember the Tom Lehrer song about Renner von Brown. Mm -hmm. I don't care where the missiles come down. That was, that was essentially the attitude. He was satirizing. He, he was there. You know, he was satirizing something that was quite real. Uh, it, by around 1970, that was changing. Uh, in fact, there was even an, under student pressure. Uh, the, the institute actually got to the point of calling off a whole day uh, just to deal with questions of science, technology, what are they for, what should we try to do, what kind of society we want. That would have been an unheard, inconceivable five years earlier. Mm -hmm. And it left a permanent stamp. And now issues like that are alive. There's a lot of activism, uh, not, you know, the Occupy movement, you know, the, the things going on all the time, we walk down the walls of the souls, you know, for every imaginable. Purpose. People, people are interested in things. And it's just changed enormously. Mm -hmm. And I think you don't expect the universities to be radical institutions. Sure. They're conservative institutions and they're going to stay like that. But they do have openings. And I think the openings are a lot wider than they were. Actually, my own experience is kind of a little unusual, but it's not untypical. In the 1960s, uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, there were, but, but the, at the early stages, there was, the, the protest was just crushed. I mean, we couldn't even have public demonstrations in Boston until '67, hmm. uh, because they'd be broken out violently by students, which is now by students. Yeah, and, and then it changed. But, uh, but there was also at the beginnings of the resistance movement, not just protests, but uh, draft resistance, deserters. Uh, uh, tax resistance, and a whole set of what are called illegal activities. Uh, the center, the academic center of that was actually a lab where I was working at MIT, which was 100% funded by the three armed services. Uh, that's the kind of an indication of the kind of opportunity that is available in universities which have, you know, there is a tradition of free inquiry. It's not observed, you know, mm -hmm. plenty of deficiencies, but it's there, you know, can't deny that it's there. And it can it come out and flourish uh, at, uh, if people have the will and dedication. Uh, and I think that's true all over. You know, I'm sure it's true here. Yes, absolutely. You know, but, uh, uh, so, yeah, Chris is correct. They are conservative institutions of a support power overwhelmingly, they're not going to ask questions, but uh, within them there are opportunities to do things. In fact, they're the freest institutions in the country. So I think they have a lot of possibilities. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And uh, it's really good to see this kind of, uh, I think, take hold. And uh, there's several different initiatives right now that are taking hold on colleges and campuses to kind of really build some of the particular, some of the things that we're planning on here. We just launched our own little Occupy puts down thing where we're talking about little things like, okay, starting with the concrete developments, like let's look at banks. Where's the bank? University of Banks at Wells Fargo. Let's get that money out of Wells Fargo. Let's get in community-based banks. Let's get in credit unions and move on. Um, with, under the whole idea, so the government's not going to help us. 
state's not going to help us. We have to do it for ourselves. So you can get as an institution. Even get down to more concrete things than that. But a, a lot of the really effective organizing in the country has begun with things like uh, getting a traffic light on a street where kids have to cross the street. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, but if the community can get together to get that, they get the sense that we can do something. If we work together, we can achieve something. Okay, let's go on to the next thing. But these are not trivial things. Mm -hmm. And that's the way organizing has to take place wherever, wherever it is. Now, that's what the Occupy Movement ought to be doing at this point, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the interesting developments, I don't know where it'll go, was the Occupy the Hood movement. Mm -hmm. uh, if they could, you know, we're like in some, in Boston, how could we, downtown Boston, who were mostly black community in Roxbury. Well, you know, if that, it didn't, but if it could have linked up, and maybe it still can, to the main Occupy movement off the financial center, that would be a step forward. Now, they have different concerns and interests. You know, they have local, very real local concerns and interests, which are significant. But the people who are talking about uh, you know, getting rid of too big to fail banks and getting money out of politics and other big things. If they can also get involved in the actual day-to-day -day problems of people who are facing hard lives, it's mutual and interactive. And they can learn a lot from it and uh, they can bring other people along. I think that's the kind of thing that has to be done. Well, I don't want to hold you up too much longer. I appreciate so much you taking the time out. Um, I know you've got an incredibly busy schedule, so I um, just wish you uh, a happy Thanksgiving and uh, yeah, just home the family and everything else. So <laughs> take care, and I hope you enjoyed your stay here at Christmas. Table? Not the kids' table! <laughs>